That'll warm us up in due course. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you at the East West Center. This morning's program uh, is with uh, Dr. Malcolm Cook, who is a senior fellow at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, who is famous and well known for many of you. And his topic is on um, uh, essentially America's trading relationship with Southeast Asia, in which uh, Malcolm is making the case that there is neither decline nor displacement, and he's going to explain a little bit about how he's come to his assessment of the current um, uh, situation in U.S. Southeast Asia trade, which runs a little bit against at least the uh, talking points or conventional wisdom. So it's, um, I always value uh, Malcolm's insights into um, the region and into U.S. relations with the region, even though he has a uh, perspective that comes both from Canada and from Australia, based in Singapore. So it gives us a gives us a lot to think about. Malcolm, welcome. I understand you're going to take about 45 minutes to show a PowerPoint. Uh, today's program is on the record and is being uh, live streamed for those who can't be here physically. And so we'll take your presentation and then we have to close sharp, sharp at about 11:10. Uh, latest so um, I'll ask you to maybe keep it to 40 45 minutes and we can take folks around the table for Q&A and, uh, and and you have a few minutes afterwards I think to meet the people in the is that right yeah. okay wonderful your show take it away all right uh, for thank yous I'd like to thank Satu for for a lot of things so asking me to do this when he passed through Singapore but for lots of things I like to Thank Sarah Wang, who organized this from the, and did it very well. And Peter, who uh, turned out an Asia-Pacific bulletin very quickly. Oh, I should have mentioned that. Um, so those three people from the um, from East-West Center. And I'd also like to thank David Shambaugh. So I'll get to why I'm thanking David soon. So I'd like to give titles to my talks. Uh, the title I had is Displacement and Deficits to Conventional Wisdoms. But I'd like to start with the somewhat ironical. So first of all, I'm not an economist. Um, there are quite a few economists at ICS, but David Shambaugh, who's writing a book on U.S.-Southeast Asia relations, spent some time at ICS a year, year and a half ago, and came up with the idea that he wanted somebody, somebody to look at the current or contemporary trading relationships between the United States and each of the 10 Southeast Asian countries, and, and I was given that task. Um, so I'd like to thank David for giving me more work. Um, and I first started looking at this, and the, this APB, Asia Pacific Bulletin, is a spin-off for a, another piece of work that I'm working on at ICS, which is looking at uh, the China contemporary trade flows between China and the 10 Southeast Asian countries, which is very significant and growing very fast and fits within all of the narratives, except Laos. Laos is the only country that doesn't fit into the narrative of increasingly uh, dominant, China is an increasingly dominant trade partner. Brunei doesn't either for a different reason. Uh, Brunei's exports to Japan in 2018 were 10 times larger than Brunei's exports to the People's Republic of China. But that's partially because Brunei is a hydrocarbon exporter, so it depends on long-term contracts. Um, and then as part of the China-Southeast Asia trade flow work, which should come out in a larger piece for uh, ICS, hopefully next week, I decided just to look at some comparisons over the last six years only. So this is not a long-term trend piece, but just contemporary last six years. Uh, so I looked at, compared the China trade figures, which are very impressive, as I said, with a couple of exceptions, with the United States, uh, with Japan, and with uh, the rest of Southeast Asia, to give a kind of comparison, how is it going? Um, and I guess what I liked about the Asia Pacific Bulletin that came out on Wednesday, and I, what I liked about the US trade figures was, how surprised I was. So the irony is this comes out of a piece looking at US-China, or China-Southeast Asia trade flows and the argument, which is largely held up that China is already the most important trading partner for the region as a whole. That gap is growing fast and is true for eight of the 10 countries. Laos is the only one where it's really quite different. Uh, and that's largely because of Thailand. Um, but the US number surprised me. Um, 
because I guess when I'm at ICS, I get a lot of interlocutors from People's Republic of China. They have an increasingly large number of delegates coming through Southeast Asia to tell the China story um, from Southeast Asia itself and many within Singapore and from the United States. And in differing languages and in differing levels of emotion, sometimes celebration for the Chinese side and some on the Southeast Asia side, and increasingly worry on the United States side, this argument that the rise of China, particularly on trade, is leading to a significant decline in displacement of the United States as a trading partner. So as China goes up, the United States goes down. Um, and that has often led into some uh, prognostications about how Southeast Asian countries should change their strategic positions or why they are perceived to be changing their strategic positions. The United States is no longer here, is declining rapidly, uh, and that's going to continue. And they often use aggregate trade flows to use that uh, to make that argument and often override other economic indicators between the US and Southeast Asia that don't fit that narrative of a declining role for the United States, absolutely not just necessarily relatively. <laughs> so the FDI flows over the last while, that doesn't fit. If you look at remittance flows, particularly to places like uh, Myanmar and the Philippines where remittances are very important, the United States is way larger than anybody else. I think remittance flows from the United States to the Philippines, according to the Philippine Central Bank, are 400 times larger than from the People's Republic of China. And even if you include Hong Kong in the China box, which is questionable but often run by economists, it's still way smaller. And a portfolio flows, which is harder as well. So it's often trade flows. Um, and again, the China story is very impressive, but the American figure surprised me given this kind of wave of arguments from, as I say, Chinese interlocutors, Southeast Asian, many in Singapore, and increasingly worried American um, <coughs> visitors. And even my two days in Washington here talking with people, I picked that up. There's this kind of sense almost of dread of the United States being a declining economic player in Southeast Asia with some own goals for sure. Not signing the TPP has come up many times. Uh, whether a Democratic Congress would have passed it under Hillary Clinton is a good question to think counterfactually anyways. Um, um, and then it, so I, the, what I did, and the Nehru before noted, I looked at 2013 to 2018, so just the current, so as so, so I say, not a long-term trend, but just the current trend of which I've noticed this discussion about this declining role of the U.S., perceived declining role of the U.S. has become much more present, and it's also the amount of time I've been at ICS as well. So I was quite surprised that if you look at U.S. export to each of the 10 Southeast Asian countries, both in US dollar terms, uh, but also as a share. So how important is the United States as an export market for each of the 10 Southeast Asian countries? The US has become more important for some, often from a very low base. The first uh, chart shows this. So if you look at Brunei's exports to the United States from 9 million in 2013 to 57 million in 2018, 57 million isn't very much, but still, that's pretty impressive. But if you look at other areas like Vietnam, you've had a doubling in US dollar figures in nominal terms, but also uh, quite a significant increase in share in the Singapore as well. But each of the 10. Oh, so I assume these are uh, goods, or does it include services? It does include services. Okay. Um, at the same time, China fits into this as well. So each of the 10 countries, China is a larger uh, export market for all of them in shares as well. But the United States is, is as well, uh, which again, kind of both surprised me and certainly at least challenges the often conventional wisdom that the United States is a trading partner, particularly because it has no FTAs in the region except one with Singapore is, is losing out. Um, if you look at the same figures over this time, 2013 to 2018, if there is a displacement effect, it certainly seems to be more on the Japan side, or I think six of the 10 countries, Japan is a, a lower share. Some of that is because of Japanese firms moving their value chains around. Um, but it, and it doesn't fit as well, and quite surprising to me. Um, Especially, as I say, the trade figures are often the ones held up to be, these are the figures that show that the United States is a 
rapidly often declining partner. Um, and China's a rapidly increasing partner. The increasing partner for this period has certainly held up for most countries. The rapidly declining part is not. Um, then on the import side, so the importance of US imports to Southeast Asian countries as well, uh, which I think is the next slide. No, no. There we go. I think six of the ten countries also have a larger share of imports from the United States. So it's not quite as um, all ten are there as well. And if you look, five of the six largest Southeast Asian economies are there too. And again, Vietnam is certainly a noticeable story where Vietnam is the largest the U.S. is the largest export market for Vietnam as it is for Cambodia um, as well, but Vietnam, the share of Vietnam, the share of U.S. imports into Vietnam, the share of total imports to Vietnam has also probably grown the most. So if you look at exports, uh, exports to the United States, uh, it's 10 out of 10, and if you look at imports from the United States, it's 6 out of 10, including 5 of the 6 largest uh, Southeast Asian economies with again, particularly Vietnam being a noticeable one here, and, and, and Myanmar or Burma, I should say, in this room or in this country. Um, Burma as well, but the Burmese figures are from quite a bit smaller. Um, so again, if you look at the two, both exports, 10 out of 10 and 6 out of 10, and if you look at total trade, I think eight of the 10 countries, the United States has a share of total trade over this period, is larger for eight out of the ten. The two that it isn't is Brunei, which again quite small figures on both sides, and that's largely on the import side, whereas Brunei's imports from the United States is declining sharply, whereas on the other side, imports from China have taken off hugely. And the Philippines, again, imports from the Philippines as a sh imports from the U.S. as a share of total imports to the Philippines has fallen quite a bit, often displaced by. Um, very sharp increases of imports from China, but the Philippines, uh, that's starting off at a high level. So eight out of 10, the United States is a more important trading partner. So certainly China is a more important trading partner for all 10, so maybe Laos, but I don't have numbers on me. Uh, and the increase in importance is much, is larger than the United States, but it's certainly not that China's rising importance means that the United States is in a negative trend for this period only a period that is of particular sensitivity politically as well. Um, and also, as I say, the period that uh, I was tasked to, to look at. Um, so both of those surprised me. So that was, uh, I'm a fan of this TV program that's called Myth Busting, where they check <laughs> out whether these things that are done in movies actually work or not. If you blow up a car, how far does it jump? I would suggest that sometimes I say bust it or not. Uh, certainly from 2013 to 2018, so end of the Obama period uh, and beginning of the Trump period, uh, this myth certainly seemed to be somewhat busted. But more importantly, from a policy point of view, this is a really good story for the U.S. to tell in Southeast Asia. Um, that it's, I think, if I was uh, in the State Department and I wasn't worried about impeachment uh, hearings, but I was in the East Asia and Pacific Department. I think this is a really good story to tell because it goes against quite a bit of the conventional wisdom um, that the United States is becoming much less important, doesn't have FTAs with us, no likelihood really of any in the offing. So uh, we should move away from focusing on the United States. Um, as I said, the numbers, at least from 2013 to 2018, when this has become more of an argument, and when these kinds of arguments about trade flows are increasingly used as a justification for arguments about what Southeast Asian states' strategic positions are or should be, as I said, not so sure it works as well as the arguers suggest it does. Um, so that's the first conventional wisdom that at least the trade figures, which as I say, are often used as the argument at least in this period, um, don't really hold up. Um, the second one, and I think this is a bad story for Southeast Asian economies to tell the United States, particularly with the Trump administration in power, 
that has a mercantilist view of trade um, that's not unique to the Trump administration, has a long history on the Republican side and on the Democrat side for that matter too, but is right up there. So the first one is a good story the U.S. can tell in Southeast Asia. Uh, we're not declining and we're not going away as a trading partner and in some senses we're more important for you now than we were five years ago. Um, this one is a bad story for Southeast Asia to tell the United States or for the United States to know about and tell Southeast Asia with only one exception and it's not a full exception that is Singapore. If you look at the last <coughs> U.S. trade balances. These are only in nominal terms. So first of all, the argument that trade deficits are bad for the country that suffers them and are a sign of either economic weakness or being taken advantage of by the trade surplus country. I don't buy this narrative intellectually, but politically it's very powerful and it's certainly being driven trade policy in the current administration. Um, so even though I think this conventional wisdom intellectually is wrong, um, from a way of looking at bilateral trade, surpluses and deficits shouldn't matter very much at all. Um, they do matter politically. <laughs> and I would imagine they're going to continue to matter as long as there is a President Trump in office, but even I would assume potentially after. And if you look at the trade, US trade position as this mercantilist would look, exports are good, imports are bad, trade surpluses are good, trade deficits are bad. Trade deficits are because we're being cheated, uh, not because we're a high cost economy with a strong dollar and they're a lower cost economy with a weaker currency, for example. Um, the US trade position in each Southeast Asian economy in nominal dollar terms has worsened from 20, in 2018 from comparing it to 2013. Uh, so in 2013, there was two countries the United States had a surplus with uh, Singapore, something Singapore mentions every time the Prime Minister talks about the United States. I think they should have a bumper sticker they give out to every American delegation that comes. Uh, I think at that point too, Laos did as well. Over 20, from over that period, each of the trade positions of the United States from this mercantilist position has got worse. Uh, the deficits of the eight countries that had deficits in 2013, in nominal terms anyways, are much larger. Some of that's just because of increase in trade flows. Um, and Laos moved from a small surplus to a small deficit. I don't think Laos is pretty very high on the target list for the USTR. And if you look at growth in Southeast Asian exports, uh, Southeast Asian countries exports to the United States in these terms, and then imports from the United States, only Vietnam has a higher growth rate of imports from the United States compared to exports to. Um, but the share of Vietnamese exports to the US is very large. The share of US imports is not so large. So all nine of the 10, eight of the 10 countries don't have a good story to tell at all. Singapore still has a good story that we still have a trade deficit our trade deficit with the United States, even though it has shrunk significantly in nominal dollar terms. Vietnam can tell the story, even though it's probably not going to be listened to. Uh, U.S. exports to Vietnam are growing at a quicker rate than U.S. imports from Vietnam. And I think this will be something I've been watching from Southeast Asia and waiting for is when the USTR uh, trade review uh, machine will move away from a predominant focus on the People's Republic of China towards other countries that were listed in 2016 as countries of concern, uh, which are all of the major Southeast Asian economies minus Singapore are on that list. And I was thinking if you look at some of the other countries on this list and others that have suffered uh, from previous examples of US mercantilist trade policies and trade reparation actions, Japan has signed a bilateral FTA with, um, with the Trump administration. South Korea quickly renegotiated the chorus on terms that at least would allow the Trump administration to claim a success. Mexico also, uh, even though they had a left-leaning government, Obrador uh, came in and did that as well. So some of the other large countries that are traditional targets of US concerns about trade deficits in the Trump administration have responded in the way the Trump administration has 
indicated they would like those countries to do sign new trade deals with us that address these concerns and also provide the Trump administration and the president himself an ability to say, I've struck a better deal with these guys than we a new deal with these guys in the case of Japan, or a better deal than struck before by Clinton or the others. No Southeast Asian state has gone down that path. The Philippines, despite Duterte's uh, ramblings about being independent from the United States, has started exploratory talks with the Trump administration, and that was a Philippine initiative from DTI. But that's moving very slowly, and I doubt we're going to see anything there. So the first story is, as I say, if I was a US diplomat in the region, or a US visiting the region, I think that's a kind of useful set of statistics to push back against the conventional wisdom of China's rise, it means not only that the US isn't becoming as, growing as in the same speed of importance as China as a trading partner, which is not certainly not at all, but it's not always the story, at least in this period, that that means that China, the United States is a decreasingly important trading partner for Southeast Asia. If I was a Southeast Asian state, particularly Vietnam, even if the numbers show that Vietnam is doing well, the Vietnamese trade surplus with the United States is very large, worse than China, according to a tweet in terms of its economic behavior, but also Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. If there is a second Trump term, or if there is a deal with China that they can claim, um, they may become next in the crosshairs. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that would be uncomfortable. <laughs> I'll stop there and uh, open it up for questions, comments, and criticisms. Great, Malcolm, thanks. I, you didn't take as much time as I, I thought your PowerPoint was longer, actually. So uh, I said 45 minutes because I thought maybe it was longer, but um, uh, nevertheless, let's let's open it up and um, who would like to start? And I have several questions, but I'll give others a chance first. Who'd like to pick? Why don't you go first? Okay, sure. A <laughs> couple, couple, couple of things. First is this issue, and we talked about it offline, you know, was one thing was this time period and the quality and the strength of the US dollar. So I was wondering how much um, that accounted for some of this. But a couple other questions I had. Um, you mentioned the US, you know, there's been these TFIF negotiations with Vietnam. Mm. Um, the president has also singled out, Indi I, let me, someone will correct me, but I believe Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, are all on the list of the countries that run significant trade deficits, the original list that came out from the administration. Is that right? Is there anyone else from Southeast Asia? Thailand. And Thailand too? But yeah. the number right here. No, no, no. I'm talking about, no, on the list from the uh, oh, Trump administration, I believe four Southeast Asian countries were amongst the top 20 deficit running countries with the US. Is that the USTR? The top 16. Of the top 16. Yeah. So if that's the case, where would you assess the progress in addressing those? Because I think it was last week or week before there were the TIFA talks with Vietnam. Mm -hmm. There was for a while the floated idea of a bilateral FTA with the Philippines, <coughs> which I suspect would be very difficult in the US Congress at present for other reasons, for complicated reasons, but, but on the trade. Um, as far as I know, on the Thai uh, front, those discussions have not even started in earnest. Mm. And of course, Indonesia is out there as well as a fourth uh, country in deficit. So one of my country's questions really was, on this list of 16, <coughs> where are we in progress with Southeast Asia on addressing these free, fair, and reciprocal trade um, concept that the administration has articulated. Second thing I want to know is quite apart from China and the US, I was very interested if you had thoughts on, it's a little early I know, but CPTPP impacts on trading. What is happening because of the CPTPP? Um, because obviously not all of the 10 Southeast Asian countries are anywhere near even CPTPP, much less DPP. Mm -hmm. But I would think that's going to have some implications as they go forward. Uh, and then finally, just say, just laid out there, related to that is this RCEP issue. If it goes into place, what kinds of expectations 
Uh, are you guys doing some modeling at ICs with your economist group and, and looking at what might happen under our sub scenarios, uh, under the kinds of envisioned agreement on tariffs, particularly what that would do to trade amongst them? So those are were the three that I kind of was on my mind. Hmm. Okay. Um, the time period, as I said, I, it was a contemporary snapshot. So this is not a long-term argument about uh, structures of international trade. Um, and it came, as I say, somewhat um, ironically from this uh, meeting with David Shamba, who convinced my boss that this would be good to look at it, and partially in help for his book. And my boss thought, one should be kind to one's uh, visitors. Um, <laughs> um, and since I was at that lunch, um, there we go. So the time period in some senses, uh, but it's also, as I said, kind of fits within this kind of contemporary kind of argument that this is happening now, and mm -hmm. it's clearly now. Um, so in that sense, a polit more of a politically driven time period. So dealing with the deficits, as I said, without a doubt, Japan right away, um, even before President Trump became president, decided developing a good relationship with Trump and talking with them on trade would be a good defensive strategy for Japan. Um, also there. Um, I think, to be fair, Southeast Asian, there's not a lot of trade negotiators in a lot of these countries. Um, if you look, and there are, they have a lot of stuff on their plate already. Um, so our set, um, and for others, Vietnam and TPP, not only the negotiation, but the implementation as well, but even some of the smaller ones. So if you look, there's also there was also the ASEAN and Hong Kong idea that was uh, stopped, um, signed off on. Um, and there are some renewals of the, some of the existing FTAs as well. So if you look at the Southeast Asian countries, trade negotiation, um, dance card, mm. it's already quite full. Mm. And again, there's quite significant um, capacity limitations for a lot of them. Um, but certainly the Philippines, which again, kind of goes against that idea that the uh, Duterte administration is all anti-American and doesn't want closer ties with the United States. And this wasn't a Department of National Defense, which has a pretty good record throughout the Duterte administration of, of holding the ring, as they call it, but the DTI, um, and, and Lopez, who at one point noted that what the president meant from a more independent foreign policy was a shift away from focus on trade with the West and focus on more trade with the region. Um, early on, when people were trying to figure out what that meant, um, but the Philippines, as I said, US is the largest export market for the Philippines, and that wasn't the case in 2013, uh, and is the most important economic partner for the Philippines overall, for sure. FDI stock is number one. Remittance flows, which is most important in some senses, political economic indicator. So there's lots of reasons. So the Philippines has moved. As I said, I think they are on to the exploratory side of the negotiations, but I haven't heard of them moving towards formal uh, movements towards, as you said, Vietnam's on TIFA. If you look, Malaysia joined the TPP negotiations after the United States joined, and if you talk to some Malaysians, not Malaysia wasn't the only one that did this, joined the TPP negotiations when the United States joined in as a way of getting a trade deal with the US, particularly because the earlier efforts at, 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 at the bilateral hadn't, hadn't moved. Um, so when the US pulled out, uh, that didn't happen. So I, I, I think on the Malaysia side, I haven't heard any movement on the Malaysian side, and this was even under Najib, under uh, Mahathir, however long he stays as president, I would be surprised if there's much more movement. Um, they haven't implemented, does someone know if they've implemented CPPP? They haven't ratified Malaysia, they haven't ratified it. Really. Brunei and Malaysia have not ratified. Brunei, they argue it's just, you know, capacity constraints they have a limited number, which is true. Malaysia, the feeling is that under Mahathir, they're not going to do that. Partially because he has a, still has an ASEAN plus three, you might see it as an adjunct deal. But talking to the Malaysian, people who follow the Malaysian economy, they are not very 
I wouldn't say they're not hopeful, whatever the opposite of not hopeful is. <laughs> Pretty dour on that side, as long as Mahathir is prime minister. And it was, even though it didn't have to go through the Malaysian parliament, the Malaysian prime minister can sign off on trade deals. Um, even Najib promised that there would be a parliamentary debate. So even under Najib, the politics of CPTPP in Malaysia meant that Najib even felt that he would have to at least open it up for discussion. Um, so that would suggest it's not only a Mahathir factor that keeping Malaysia behind. I think Malaysia has concerns with the Huniputra policy. Um, on CPTPP effects, the economists would say it's too early to tell, so I'll steal that from my friends. Um, certainly, I think a couple of things. One, Vietnam, I think you might see a good thing to track is Japanese investment into Vietnam, particularly in autos, for example. Mm -hmm. Will there be a movement away from Thailand, the traditional one? Mm -hmm. Or even Indonesia was starting to get some automobile and, uh, investment into their uh, what they want. And everybody wants to be the second Detroit or the second Bangkok. Uh, CPTPP has. Um, certain benefits for the auto trade, particularly if people still think there's a chance the United States will go back in. Um, I would think there. The other thing about CPTPP, at least for the Vietnamese, is I think it was always an equally important strategic move for them. Same with Singapore. I think they see it as not only an economic way of opening up markets and uh, getting more efficient allocation of capital, but uh, strategic play. Um, and I think Vietnam still see that as quite prominent. And RCEP scenarios, um, I've always been a bit skeptical of how much RCEP may move trade figures. I remember talking with some senior Singapore people who are part of the RCEP team and this was when CPTPP or TPP was still on and I asked them which one do you think would be the more important and they were Categorical. <laughs> and not only that TPP would be more important, but they didn't have very much expectations of our set. And it wasn't only because of the India dragging the chain side. Um, we didn't think it would be that high quality a deal. Um, so, as I said, at our institute, I don't, we, I don't think we have anybody doing the, the modeling yet. Um, hmm. But from what I hear, this is from what I hear, including that there's a better chance than before the last meeting that they'll have something to sign in November. Um, we've all heard before that our set may has you know the lights at the end of the tunnel. The tunnel's getting shorter, so it's either going to be black or light. And from what I hear, there's a good chance. There's some argument that India, for a strategic decision has changed its negotiating policy in a way that makes it less of a problem. There was also pressure on Australia and New Zealand to reduce the ambition of their negotiating position, so it wasn't only an India play. Um, there was an argument that Australia and New Zealand were trying to push too much TTP-like content into our set. <clears throat> so there was this threat of a move starting in ASEAN plus three parallel tracks not just throwing India out, which is often being talked about, but an ASEAN plus, which would fit better within the ASEAN framework, right? There's already a long existing ASEAN plus three track, so they wouldn't create something new. And also the East Asian Vision Group report talks about an ASEAN plus East Asian community moving forward, which is an ASEAN plus three construction. So, um, so, Modeling on our set may suddenly become more important to do. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks a lot, Matthew. This is this is a very interesting paper and very useful because <clears throat> you know it is important to recognize that there is this upward trend in trade growth between the United States and ASEAN, and the US share in ASEAN trade is also rising. So in other words, it's a growth rate which is higher than the average growth rate of trade for ASEAN. So that's a very interesting point. Uh, but I think in doing this analysis, you might have 
you missed a couple of opportunities which are useful to sort of raise. The first, op the first point is that this, as you say, is the last five years for which there is data. And it turns out that it's the only five years in which this growth has occurred over the last 20 years. Right? So for 15 years, there's been a continuous decline in the U.S. share. And the last five years, there's been this small increase. The question is why? Why this inflection? You know, and, and the, you, you were trying to allude to that, you're talking about exchange rates, but there are so many other factors. And sure. It's a really interesting question to ask, why is it that for 15 years, continuously, there's been a decline? And for five years, there's been this increase. What happened in 2013 mm. that led to this inflection point? The second question <clears throat> is that while there has been this growth in trade with, between ASEAN and the United States, trade between ASEAN and China has been even faster. In other words, China's share has continued to rise at a rate that is faster than the rise in the US share. At the expense of, as you point out, Japan, the EU, and, and other trading partners. Um, and then the question arises, is this going to stop? <laughs> Yeah, because uh, of the trade war uh, and so forth. And was this going to occur anyway, given the rise in real wages in China, relocation of investments from China to, to ASEAN? So how much is this growth in ASEAN the result of relocation, in other words, uh, from China? Yeah. Um, and how much of it is something else which I fail to, fail to understand, to be honest. Um, so, and then I have a sort of bunch of other questions ready, and that those questions are the following. Um, to be honest, you know, this whole business of calculating trade the way we do it is old-fashioned because it looks at outputs, not value added. So it's really useful to look at TIVA, trade and value added, to see really what is the, uh, what is the underlying value added that's being exported and imported. Mm -hmm. right. So you can have countries which add very little value, but it looks like their trade is growing astronomically, when actually the real economic content of that trade is very small. Yeah. And I suspect there's a lot of that happening in Vietnam, there's a lot of that happening perhaps in Cambodia and Laos, some of these spillovers of relocation of firms, uh, and certainly also in Thailand. Mm -hmm. So the real question is, you know, what's happening in, in, in value added? You're referring to kind of the a little bit about the I, I forget was the IMF or like someone did the sort of deconstructing the iPhone yeah. and sort of what is the value added to an iPhone rather than right. you know adding the the full cost of the iPhone as a Chinese yeah. export? That's right. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And, and now there is a new database which has value oh, added. Oh, okay. yeah, absolutely. It's called Diva. It's trade and value added. So the Diva database provides a rich new information on this. It may not shed light on all the issues that you raise because it's still a growing database, but that's, uh, that's the other questions that that sort of arose in my mind was, and I'm not sure about this, but how much of Singapore's trade data is corrected for transshipment? Mm. Uh, and you know, I know that there is some of this correction that takes place. In other words, mm -hmm. a lot of those goods don't actually enter Singaporean ports, <laughs> but a lot do. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a growth rate of 5.8% of you know, uh, Singaporean trade in the United States, how much of this is just simply Southeast Asian exports going by Singapore mm -hmm. and repackaged and sort of reshipped? I just, I just don't know the answer to that. Um, same problem with FDI flows. Oh, so absolutely. Much bigger. Yeah. I mean, much bigger. As far as FDI is concerned, it's a much bigger deal because Singapore is the largest foreign investor in virtually every country hmm. in Asia. Yeah. The largest foreign investor in China, it's the largest, right. largest foreign investor in India, it's the largest right. foreign investor in Myanmar, it's the largest foreign investor in Indonesia. Right. And we all know it's not Singaporean investor. Um, but we don't know who it is because <laughs> that data is simply not being, it's not available. It's not made available by the Singaporean statistical authorities. I remember the three such places, Singapore's one, Mauritius was one, yes. because of the nature the of round the tax tripping, Indian round tripping. Round -tripping. Yeah. And the other was a, 
for the life of me can't remember, but a small uh, European country, one of these places where money was, because of the tax provision, it goes there, it goes there and it comes back, and there was a way of. But I can doing assure it. you that's the case right. for Singapore in FBI in India, it's right. the case for Singapore in FBI right. in Indonesia, right. and it's definitely the case for Singapore in FBI in Myanmar. Right. That Singapore in FBI in Myanmar is actually Myanmar generals repatriating their money back to a growing economy uh, and, and taking advantage of the, of, of yeah. the upside. So there's a lot that's hidden in this data, frankly, that needs to be needs to be uh, teased, teased out. The next, I mean, little, it's nothing to do with your presentation, but it's it's, it's, it's to do with trade flows in, in, in ASEAN and, 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 and how they might change. So the latest news of yesterday was that there's a lot of financial services and especially wealth management services moving out of Hong Kong and going to Singapore mm -hmm. because of the Hong Kong unrest. So you're going to see Mm. large increase in services exports from Singapore to the United States but that's just the displacement of Hong Kong services right mm. nothing to do with the US or Singapore mm. uh, but a third a, 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 a third a third area and lastly I think this point about bilateral trade deficits is really important and I'm glad you also raised it uh, Satu um, I think there's a large part of these bilateral trade deficits, as you pointed out, Malcolm, is to do with the competitiveness of the United States. It's simply not competitive in the range of imports that these countries uh, import. But the big worry is now that Vietnamese bilateral trade deficits are set to grow very rapidly with the relocation of firms. It's already very high, right? So it's already in the crosshairs of US trade authorities. Mm -hmm. For the wrong reasons, but it's there, whether we like it or not. But it's going to grow very rapidly. With whom? The, the bilateral trade deficit between Vietnam and the United States. Right. Because of right. firms relocating because to China. Because of firms relocating to China. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, you know, there's a there's a great danger. And, and, and these are, by the way, many of them are US firms. Many of them are Japanese firms. Mm. So if this leads to retaliatory action by the United States, they're actually going to be hurting. US not Vietnamese firms, but US firms and Japanese firms and European firms. Right? So shift the debate a little bit because uh, uh, there might be sort of, again, pushback from so-called, I'm putting in what called allies of the United States, those who have very close ties to the US. So I'd be interested in your views as to how that is likely to, to, to play out. Yeah. Um. So why this inflection point? I don't know. Um, <laughs> and I didn't even know that I picked this kind of inflection point. Um, so I'll go back and think of it that maybe there'll be a future APB on the inflection point. Because um, it was interesting, too, looking at some of the trade figures, uh, particularly from Malaysia and so forth. So I'm not mistaken. The, total trade of Malaysia in 2018 for Malaysia was smaller than 2013. So there was this kind of big dip in some of the key, um, I think probably ex electronic exporters on this period. So there was a, there is a recovery going back, but there was this kind of really big shift, which could um, be a factor, particularly for the larger economies. Um, on the rise of the China and the, and the trade war. I remember looking at 2014, I did a paper for ICS, I think I called it the second wave, which looked at Japanese FDI photos and where they were going using um, Jetro statistics that they come out with that. And there was a very clear, from I think about 2012 onwards, a re um, a downgrading, a reduction of the new flows to so not negative, a reduction in the growth of flows of Japanese FDI into China, as well as into India, but for different reasons, and then a significant refocusing on Southeast Asia. So there was the kind of post plaza Accord bang, and that was, and when you looked at the Japanese firm data, why did you start in Indonesia suddenly for the first time ever replace China as the most attractive market for FDI for last first time in like eight or ten years that China wasn't number one. And when you looked at the factors, it was exactly labor costs, 
that a difficulty of keeping labor as well, so not only the rising costs, but heavy keeping. But also labor. riots against Japanese firms in China, which yeah. really spooked them. Yeah, and they might not have told that to the um, <laughs> reviewers, and there was no mention of some country tensions. But there were other things like IP, concerns about IP, and, um, and just contract. So that was already at least the Japanese, which is the largest source of FDI uh, in Southeast Asia, outside of the US, but the US is predominantly in finance and insurance and is heavily centered in Singapore. So if you take out that element, Japan is number one. So that was already happening, the trade war, especially if it looks like it's going to continue uh, for the foreseeable future, I think um, will aggravate that. And I think one of the risks we're going to run is people are going to look at the potential increase of FDI flows into Southeast Asia that might have gone into China before, and Chinese FDI flows into Southeast Asia only say this is a trade war effect, where Chinese firms were also starting to move lower end production out of China into places like Cambodian textiles for the same reasons. Um, I think one interesting thing that I'm going to work on um, with, with a Casey Lee, who's a very good economist with us, I think the FDI displacement effects of the trade war is, um, is that we can see there are increased movements of FDI into um, Vietnam and Thailand, particularly from Chinese firms as well over the last year and a half. So you can start to see that that must be partially driven by trade war movements to get outside the tariff war. While that's going to deepen Southeast Asia-China economic relations, particularly on FDI and manufacturing, not a strength historically, but it's also going to reallocate Japanese, South Korean, and Taiwanese FDI back into Southeast Asia that might have continued to go into China as well. So may I ask you a question about that? Yeah. So this is really interesting. If these are Chinese firms, don't they come up against capital export control? Uh, controls in China, because China has very strong outward capital controls. Yeah, right? and they've increased over the last year. Yeah, so how does this yeah. fit into that? Yeah, I don't know. I'm, it's also where might they be borrowing the money to put it up. But, so there, there I don't, but you can see the numbers, and again, we're only talking in the last six months that you can start to see, So, it's, but it's pretty impressive. Um, so you have this greater the U.S. trade war will deepen East Asian economic integration and Southeast Asia's economic integration with all of the different Northeast Asian economies, which is uh, really interesting, uh, beneficial for those that support East Asian integration, uh, side effect of the trade war. Um, so that's something we're going to try to figure out. Can we get numbers that are clear enough that can't be explained by others? On Tiva, I fully agree, but part of why I did this and why I wanted to do this as a non-economist is the polit political language on trade is very old-fashioned, right is wrong on the bilateral deficits, and it just looks at aggregate trade flows. It doesn't look at breaking it down. And that's part of the problem we're having. It's the politics of trade that are driving. Yeah, economists have flattened their heads for all of their life telling politicians that free trade works in the long run. <laughs> but part of your role and part of it is to educate that yeah. and, and inform that debate. So, the numbers yes. analysis. so I agree, but for this piece, I wanted to look at what are the political language on trade, mm -hmm. including on that other side that the United States is this kind of rapidly declining player in Southeast Asia, so we should, you get, should get off the US boat and jump on the China boat. Sure, that's true at all. Uh, or Americans saying, "Have we lost Southeast Asia to China already?" Um, no. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to look at it that way, rather than the economic argument, which is again bilateral deficits don't matter at all, or shouldn't be a focus of points. Um, and yeah, don't blame the other side. Look at your own house, <laughs> uh, including. Uh, um, uh, all kinds of reasons. Um, so that's why I focused it on this and why I focused it on the time period too. Because again, and if you look at it in longer term frames as the inflection point shows, you get a different story, but that's not the language and the lens that people are using now. Um, on Singapore, I, I kind of looked at 
Southeast Asia. One of the other comparisons was with trade with the rest of Southeast Asia. And Singapore, particularly for the CLMB countries, is a declining export market quite rapidly. So I wrote this other piece. If you look at Vietnam's trade with the rest of Southeast Asia, in 2013 it was quite small. I think 14% of Vietnamese exports went to Southeast Asia, including Singapore. It's now 10.7% in 2018. If you look at imports, um, same thing. Um, if you look at the CLMB countries' exports to the rest of Southeast Asia, drastic declines. We're talking about 82% loss in nominal dollar terms. Imports from South, Southeast Asian countries to the CLM um, grew very substantially. So kind of really interesting. But on the export side to Singapore, that would suggest that Singapore is becoming a less important trading partner and node as well. And I also looked at whether Hong Kong would be a growing player as well. So, and Hong Kong, apart from the Philippines, if I remember, isn't that important a trading partner with any Southeast Asian country. Philippine exports, I'm not sure why it's there, but Singapore is a declining player. Um, the rest of Southeast Asia for CLM exports um, is also rapidly declining. You're looking at shell, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually trade within Southeast Asia is growing at 10% a year. It's just that trade with China is growing at 20%. Yeah, so so it's, I was that's putting it in perspective. So yeah. the share, it looks like it's falling, but actually it's growing very rapidly yeah. compared to global trade. Yeah, so I was looking at share. Um, yeah, and financial services um, flows. The number I heard was, again, Singapore has a line and the Prime Minister Lee said the disruption in Hong Kong is bad for Hong Kong, it's bad for the region, and it's bad for Singapore. <laughs> I'm sure that's true, but I do also know many, uh, many businesses in Singapore, including real estate, are quite happy and already starting to see signs of movement, um, including in real estate markets and tourism flows, but also financial movements. There was one measure I saw where over the last two months, I think, they tracked what they thought was a movement of $4 billion from Hong bank accounts in Hong Kong to bank accounts in Singapore. So that's only one very partial measure. And that's, that's you know, you're not quite at the Asian financial crisis levels where Indonesians bailed out of Indonesian banks, but that's quite significant. Um, and when I was talking to business people in Singapore, what they expect to happen isn't so much a reduction of the existing operations in Hong Kong, so fleeing Hong Kong to Singapore, but when firms are looking at where do we want to expand, uh, or where are we going to grow our businesses and put in new functions. Singapore was already starting to win uh, some of that stuff in FinTech and other areas. Um, some of its cost, but that's where they think. So it's a kind of opportunity cost for Hong Kong. What the money that might have gone to Hong Kong before to tap into the China market because of the problems in Hong Kong, you can tap into the China market from Singapore, will come into Singapore. Yeah, Vietnam, I think, in Vietnam, I think it's in a lot of trouble on the trade side. Because again, if you look at the shares, right, Vietnam, Vietnamese imports from the U.S. are growing faster, but they're from a much smaller level. So if you just look at dollar terms, the gap is still, and there's no way you're going to shrink that gap in any first, that just volume or value terms. And the other problem for Vietnam is if the United States starts you know, turning its very large USTR guns onto Vietnam, that puts all of Vietnamese foreign policy in a really difficult position. Because even when they joined TPP, some of it was to drive domestic um, reform, you know, your standard, how do we shrink these loss-making SOEs and not get the blame? We have to sign this thing, gaiatsu, as they call it in Japanese. But the other was, we'll take this economic cost because we want to have this agreement with the United States. So there was this kind of strategic call um, that's quite powerful. So if the United and there is, if the United States, as I say, starts treating Vietnam as an economic problem, that's going to make it very difficult for the Vietnamese leaders. 
because you already know the Chinese will sit there and say, we're not doing that to you, and we can increase imports. 2014, when the oil rig incident came up, Vietnamese lychee exports to China, which is about 80% of the lychee export market from Vietnam, fell 50%. 2015, after the oil rig situation had calmed down, exports were back above 2013 levels. There was no health scare with Vietnamese lychees in 2014. <laughs> so the Vietnamese are very aware the Chinese can turn the tap on or off on these things. If the Americans start to play hardball with Vietnam, including language that the current president likes to use on these things, it's going to put Vietnam's whole positioning and strategy in a very difficult position. So it's not only on the trade side that I worry for Vietnam, but... Let I me mean, just make a point. I, I completely agree. I think bigger this picture. problem is not just with Vietnam. This is an issue with virtually every Southeast Asian country. China now has enormous economic leverage. The whole of it, because it is the largest trade part. Yeah. Uh, can, can I ask you on this, since you're having a discussion about this, is this <laughs> supposed to be... Uh, so I, and I really do invite others. I, please, please. <laughs> I, I kind of wanted to build on that um, yeah. because, especially as we're talking, of, okay, it seems like the numbers, the picture is better than the rhetoric, but it's still tenuous, especially when we're looking from a U.S. foreign policy, U.S. engagement in the region, and when we're also talking about potentially economic sanctions on some of these countries because of increasing, well, decreasing democracy, increasing non-democratic actions in the same period. I'm curious then when, where does stuff like um, EVA in Cambodia, how does, because it seems like the numbers are good, but yeah. it's tenuous and China has enormous, every time the US dis and Europe disengages, it's a potential for China to engage differently. Right. And, and, let, and, and let me add to that because that's the flip side is that Deficit pressures, negotiating pressures, I'm conscious that Vietnam next year will host EAS. And so inevitably, as such things happen, there will be some more attention to Vietnam in the run out to next November, when it hosts now. Depending on our politics, we'll see how much attention there is, but there will be some at least amongst the Asia wallets. So, so that, that's one. But, but the counter to that, the issue of uh, our position on trade deficits and getting to free fair reciprocal trade over the next year. I'm very conscious of Vikram's excellent point about 15 years and the longer trend and the leverage. But I must say I also hear in Southeast Asia that a slowing Chinese economy and a Chinese economy that is vertically integrated and has more restrictions has ceilings too. And that's why Southeast Asia is carefully looking for alternatives. I mean, at one point, I actually did the numbers. I may be completely off when I did them five, six, seven, eight years ago, I can't remember. When I just was out of curiosity wondering, how did Southeast Asia deal with old metropoles and now with the EU? What share did, did the EU occupy? And it was somewhere between 12 and 16%, as I recall, vaguely, for all Southeast Asian countries. So if you're saying displacement, you're essentially saying now um, that it's, my worry is this is pla being placed in the US-China framework. When Japan remains important, EU remains important. I, I, yeah, and ROK, I was gonna ask you about ROK, because you haven't, ROK has come out quite strong yeah. in trade. It's, it's become not the fifth largest. Trade fifth trade. largest, okay. I didn't, I didn't know this was yours. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> well, that answers my question. I think it does, but... So it is still a U.S.-China. But I think you're very right in pointing to uh, the fact that there is upward integration in China, and that's why there's a displacement of labor-intensive production. Right. East Asia, right. Orma, reflection of the restructuring that's going on within China. Right. And that's actually of greater relevance, in my view, to the advanced economy, because China is now going to become a direct competitor with the advanced economy, rather than being simply a supplier mm. of labor-intensive products. And that role is going to be taken on increasingly 
by Southeast Asia. Perhaps, perhaps India, India gets its trade policy mm. brothers together. That's very interesting. But I thought that was a yeah. major point you yeah. made. Yeah. That any attempt by the United States at turning its USTR guns on Southeast Asia would play into the hands of China and make give China much greater leverage, even if you know, trade growth with China slows. You know, sure. In other words, that's no that's less of a sure factor. Sure. And we know that China does not hesitate in using trade as a lever for strategic advantage. It's the reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, on the human rights issues, Cambodia, of course, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. China is not a major export market for Cambodia because it's textiles, right? I think it's fifth largest, if I remember. Mm -hmm. I remember. But if you, again, if you're looking at the whole supply chain, <clears throat> increasingly the supply chains are. Chinese raw materials, Southeast Asian manufacturing, and then export to Africa, but it stays within Chinese corporations the whole time. Right. And that's Vietnam and the TPP. The and that's yeah. true of US corporations as well. A lot of it is intra firm trade. Mm -hmm. Quite right. That's because there's three, three things I think about US potential non economic driven economic actions. If, U.S. removes the special status for Hong Kong and says you're now, we're going to treat you like you're part of the PRC. That's a huge problem. There's discussions of that going to happen. If the Rohingya situation and other things make Myanmar even more hard to deal with. Um, and then Cambodia, if the EU and the U.S. or EU and U.S. sit there and slam the door on textile exports from Cambodia. Mm. Huge problem for Hun Sen, but also it will be remembered for a long time. So yeah, not a better picture, but a ray of sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> Big one. I'm sorry, I, I, we do have to end this uh, formal session and the, and the broadcast. Um, I know some of you may want to come up and ask um, uh, Malcolm, some questions offline, uh, but we will formally adjourn uh, this seminar session. And uh, thank you again for joining us and appreciate your interest. If you're not on our um, East West Center mailing list for events, publications, seminars, uh, please consider doing so. You can leave uh, either your card or there's a sign up sheet outside that you're really welcome to put your name and email on, and we'd be happy to, uh, to put you on our mailing list. But thank you again for joining. And um, most especially, thank you, Malcolm, for coming here to discuss this uh, topic. I think there's going to be a lot more in the series, and we'll look forward to your additional work that you were uh, that you were saying you're going to be doing with Cassie and others. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Apologies, this is my third day, and the jet lag <laughs> hit this morning, so I was a little less lucid and full of energy than I usually am. But and now it's time to get on the plane again. Yeah, tomorrow, I'm <laughs> on the plane. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Malcolm. Thank you.